Every team, every topic, everywhere. This is Believe. Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäbe sein Lied. Hello and welcome to Gegen Pressing or Aloha because I'm still on Hawaii. I'm your host Manu Veed. He's Stefan Bienkowski. Stefan, how's it going? Yeah, very well. Frozen to a bone, unfortunately. Uh, it's minus six where I am right now. Uh, just back from walking the dog and uh, like it's it's bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers how cold it is here, but. I've got the heater under the desk, so I'm doing okay for now. Yeah, no, I no no heater needed where I am. It's a <laughs> nice and balmy 26 degrees, <laughs> whatever that is in Fahrenheit. Um, it's been lovely, really nice doing a hike today out to Diamond Head in Hawaii. So yeah, it's going to be nice, really nice. Um, just had a call with a friend in Germany just before we went on this, and he told me minus 10 degrees in Frankfurt. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> I may or may not come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That doesn't sound much fun. Yeah, no, it does not. Um, also, and I, I meant to say this on the um, on the Monday show, Stefan. Um, it completely escaped me. This is the the subscriber, sub, Substack show, right? Which will be available for everyone this week, mm -hmm. I think. But what I meant to say... Um, And it's been, when, when you're on holiday, things, you know, are crazy. And um, so kind of feel bad for forget completely forgetting about this. But Grand Wall, Stefan, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's been really supportive about the show, mm. um, sadly passed away during the World Cup in Qatar. Um, condolences to the family. He's been a giant of journalism in North America. Mm. Um, I think that's the only way to describe it. And um, yeah, really helpful whenever we needed something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, really supportive of this project. Um, so yeah, condolences to the family. Uh, I think we both were quite shocked when we saw the news. Yeah, without a doubt, he's always a very nice guy. I never actually met him in person, but I've spoke to him a number of times. Uh, I've actually interviewed him a few times for projects I've done. Um, and you know, considering his status and, you know, the following that he had online and how busy he was, uh, the thing that always stood out to me was he was always more than happy to put time aside just to talk about US soccer. Um, mm. You know, for the biggest, smallest publications, whatever you want to call it. And it's just been, it was heartbreaking to see the news. I couldn't quite believe it when I woke up in the morning. Um, and then... To see just the kind of, I mean, because a lot of people who listen to this podcast maybe don't use Twitter. Um, you know, it's yeah. it, it is a small bubble which is mostly journalists, so I completely understand if they don't. But uh, it, his his name was trending in the UK uh, just because of all the journalists, sports journalists over here who had stories to tell uh, about how nice a guy he was in person and online. So mm. I think he leaves behind a wonderful legacy. Um, Yeah, and you'll be sorely missed. Yeah, definitely. So once again, uh, thoughts go to the family. Um, yeah, very, very tragic. Uh, Stefan, this is a mailback show. Mm. The last one of the year. Mm. It is. We were trying to figure out what to do for this show. Um, and we figured just <laughs> asking people to send in their questions. And yeah, we should have done it after the first podcast went out because about 80% of the questions were, hey, what do you guys think about Manuel Neuer breaking his leg while skiing? And hey, what do you guys think about Gio Reyna? And we had to quickly put in, uh, so this is a chat function on the Substack app, which means subscribers can, can well, quite literally chat with us. So uh, mm. I put it in there and asked, and I had to very quickly put in a follow-up message being like, we covered both these topics on the main show Let's try and move on to something else. So hopefully we answered any questions that people had about those two topics on that show. Uh, but yeah, we've got quite a lot of questions. Should we just dive into it then? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll start with Robert's question, Robert Cervantes. Yeah, go uh, for it. Uh, which club mostly benefits from this long break and which clubs does it hurt the most? Does the long break mean coming down to earth for Union Berlin Freiburg? Um, I feel like we kind of answered that question already, but what I thought was quite interesting um, because as we you know, kind of research the questions ahead of time before the show, mm. I brought up this crazy stat that since 1982, uh, Bayern Munich always had a player in the World Cup final, right? Um, mm. And that is going to continue because there's a player playing for France and also a player playing for Morocco. So no matter who wins that game, mm. it's going to, you know, there's going to be a Bayern player in the final. Um but then you added that it is actually always a Bayern player and always an Inter Milan player. Mm. And that's also going to continue, which is just <laughs> crazy. But the, so there's a little, little bit of a, a stat for you. And I think, you know, Bayern Munich, it's interesting. I think that the, the World Cup is going to impact them quite a bit. Yeah. Um, because they are going to have key players playing literally to the end of the tournament, even though Bayern Munich at uh, Germany went out early. Uh, there's a Freudian slip. Um, you know, because of France, the, the big contingent that plays for France, the, um, you know, players on, player on the Morocco side, um, there's going to be Bayern Munich players involved all the way up to the final weekend because of the, the third place match, right? Mm. And so I do think that it's going to impact them quite a bit. Mm. And... You know, I think that teams like Union and Freiburg probably make good use out of this break. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought so. I think Union Berlin in particular will be more than happy with this extended break because, um, you know, towards the end of the first half of the season there, they were beginning to really kind of look quite heavy-legged. Um, mm. You know, they're slipping up with results and things. But, yeah, I think it would be hard to tell which clubs in particular – uh, benefit from it. I completely agree with you. Bayern not only have players who are, will likely go the full distance in the competition, but they've also lost a number of players. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hernandez, Manuel Neuer technically didn't break his leg at the World Cup, but it was shortly afterwards. So, <laughs> um, and you know, Benjamin Pavard's obviously had his difficulties as well. Um, and I'd maybe even add Upamecano to that, just because he was having a very strong season with Bayern. He had a strong start to the competition, but. He looked very rattled in that England game, I must admit. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how he kind of bounces back against Morocco to see if he kind mm. of can continue his composure because um, he, for, for 90 minutes, he looked like the older McCanner rather than one who's kind of looked like he'd settled at Bayern. So, yeah, I think Nagelsmann's probably will be watching the remaining games with, you know, um, concern. Uh and yeah, I think that's kind of the gist of it. I kind of my my newsletter for this week was kind of covering how you know Dortmund's attacking line are returned from this World Cup with all sorts of issues. Um, <laughs> had some guy on Twitter kind of caught, pull me up and say, you know, I used to really enjoy the podcast, but all they seem to do is have a go at Dortmund these days. Uh, and someone responded saying. I'm a Dortmund fan. We deserve it. <laughs> so I thought that was quite good. <laughs> well, I, I, can't, I wish I could remember the name of the person who pulled them up for that, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, it was a, as a at za Bundesliga actually Deutsche Fußball. Who's yeah. So um, I was trying to pull up some because we got on a weekly or bi-weekly basis we get one Bayern fan saying we're, we're, we're anti-Bayern then we get a Dortmund fan saying we're anti-Dortmund and I wish I could just kind of collate these tweets so I could point out that we seem to be doing alright because we seem to be pacing off Bayern and Dortmund fans in equal measure but anyway uh, yeah so I'd say yeah. maybe Bayern, Bayern and Dortmund might be coming out of this World Cup with a few bumps and bruises uh, and the likes of Freiburg and Union Berlin should be fine yeah I have to point out that Leipzig have players all the way to the end too yeah, Vadio, that's true. Right? Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, and they lost Nkunku um, in the build-up of the World Cup. So, um, and Frankfurt have Kolumani and Gladbach, Turam all the way to the end. So mm. there's a few few Bundesliga players involved all the way to well the final weekend, right? Mm. What whatever which whichever place or whichever direction it's gonna go, um, and possibly some added depending on what Bayern Munich do with the goalkeeper situation, which I am going to take a much more in-depth look at for my newsletter this week. Um, mm. So 
um, yeah. Um, next is Hu Tong Wong. With Watzke getting more power at the DFB, what changes and impact do you think he will bring to the national team? Do you see it as a positive move? Well, we're going to get more meetings because that's what Germans love. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... So I don't actually... I know there's been a lot of criticism about this... Um, what the Germans call an Arbeitskreis. Hmm. <laughs> which is essentially just a fancy word of saying a meeting yeah. uh, with all these top hats. Um, I don't hate it. Um, I do think there is, I do get all the jokes. Like I saw somewhere in one of the German tweeters that I follow um, said, so essentially the Doppelpass is now going to run German football. <laughs> if those people who don't know Doppelpass is a weekly Sunday football talk show that runs on Sport 1 mm. um, and it invites all the biggest heads of German football and all they do is basically argue for I guess it's <laughs> two hours 10 to 12 right or 11 yeah. to 1 um, and then they drink vice beer at the end and make peace um, it's a very German show <laughs> 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 and, and <laughs> so uh, I saw someone tweeting so essentially Doppelpass is now running German football which yeah that's a fair point um, but I don't know. I think these people were kind of running German football anyway, so you might as well make it official. Yeah. You know, only thing I have, the only issue I have with this really is I think Sky Sports in Germany put up this kind of graphic of the five guys, you know, the, <laughs> yes, <I thought. laughs> looking like some sort of um, um, Marvel <laughs> Super Comics hero series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, like, I was looking through that lineup, you've got Obviously, you've got um, Rudy Wohler, you have mm. uh, Karl Heinz Rummenigge, Oliver Kahn, Matthias Sammer, and Oliver Mitzen. Um, Mitzen. Oh, I can't speak Mitzlaff. Sorry, bloody hell. Um, yep. And I was talking to some people on this about Twitter uh, today, and I was saying the only one out of those five who really has a bona fide record in terms of running a football club and improving a football club and taking them to the very top it's probably Karl Heinz Rummenigge to an extent. You know, Rudy Vuller's mm. been at Leverkusen for a long time. You can argue whether Leverkusen have actually made any great gains. Uh Matthias Sammer, obviously he's had he had experience uh, at Bayern Munich as well when Pep Guardiola was there with, with Karl Heinz Rummenigge. Uh, not Rummenigge. Yeah, of the treble. Yeah, of he's course. The yeah. The treble. And, and he's now kinda of helping at Dortmund, whether Still waiting to see if anything comes from that. Over can at Bayern. I think the jury's still out, which is fine. Uh, and then Mitzlaff at Leipzig, who, you know, Leipzig maybe have got things back on track, but they still, like Dortmund, aren't quite at the level to start challenging Bayern where they should be. So, you know, I was kind of... Th and, then, and then if you add Vatska to that, who, you know, I think deserves credit for what he's done in the past for Dortmund, like way in the past from kind of stopping them from getting liquidated, but that team have been kind of treading water for at least 10 years now. Sorry, the club have been treading water for about 10 years mm -hmm. now. So it's, I kind of made a joke. I was like, oh, right. So the guys who already run German football have been asked to sit in the same room together once or twice a year to continue running German football. And yeah. there's, there's no one really there that kind of inspires me, to be honest with you. You know, maybe Rummenigge's kind of got some good ideas. I know Matthias Sammer's a smart guy, so maybe he, yeah. you know, but... I don't know. It, it it seems quite bizarre to me. It seems like a kind of land grab from the clubs, to be perfectly honest with you, to ha to, to be more involved with these things. But mm. I don't know. I, it it doesn't really it doesn't really. In, in, my doesn't count my count. So my counterpoint to all of that is that it ensures that this is this is is strength for unity, mm. right? It ensures that they you don't have these different power brokers, and that's what they are. At the end of the mm. day, that's what they are, right? Yeah. Um, that they are pulling at the same string. <laughs> do you think it'd be quite interesting if at the first meeting uh you know whoever steps in at the dfb um to replace beerhoff sits everyone down and says right oliver can how do you think we can improve the national team and his answer is well i think we should first consider getting rid of 50 plus one because that seems to be his answer to everything these days <laughs> i mean maybe he's not wrong that's that's probably why leipzig is sitting on the board <laughs> Yeah, Leipzig and Nova can at the back of the room just giggling about fifth plus one. But I like Oliver Minzlaff's appointment because he's a guy who doesn't come from football. 
Mm. He's um, from outside of football, and he's actually now a CEO at, at Red Bull, mm. right? So he's obviously made his way into actual business. And yes, it's very controversial. A lot of German football fans are going to cringe and all that. But here's a guy who's actually built a company from scratch successfully and has gotten awarded by it by actually moving into actual corporate structure outside of football. So, mm. you know, that's I, that I find interesting. And I actually like Rudi Feller's appointment too. Like The guy actually managed to lead a very limited German national team to a World Cup final. Mm. No one else in that room has done that. Mm. I guess Oliver Kahn was on the team, but I mean, you know, like he at least has the expertise of, or knows what it is like to run and complete a successful tournament. Mm. So with a, with a team that really should had no business being in that final. Yeah. But how long ago um, was that? Why did we just get Barty Volts back while we're at it? I learned the other day on Twitter that like apparently World Cups are like leap years. The years in between don't count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Well, that's that's convenient. But <laughs> anyway, should we move on to our next question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, oh, this one is a good one. It's almost Christmas. So at the Bundesliga Christmas party, this is for Mike Reed. Mm. Um, it's almost Christmas. So at the Bundesliga Christmas party, number one, what German food would you serve? And number two, would you ask who would you ask to be Santa Claus and why? Huh. So they, it, it, is Mike asking which Bundesliga player or manager should be Santa Claus? I guess so. Hmm. Anyone come to mind for you? Well, so first of all, I mean, German traditions are a little bit different. Well, for me at least, I'm from the South, right? I'm from Bavaria. Mm. Santa Claus comes on December 5th or December 6th, the night of December 5th to 6th, right? Um, and then on Christmas, which is the 24th, not the 25th, Christmas Eve is what we celebrate. Mm. It's the Kiss Kindle, um, which yeah. is a, the Christmas angel. Um, so for me, Christmas is a little bit different. Um, but Santa Claus, I mean, Carla Zomene had an epic beard the other day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite interesting because, um, my dad's Polish and he also celebrates Christmas on Christmas Eve as well. Uh, not as early as the 5th or the 6th, did you say? Uh, but... yeah, so that's that's Saint Nicholas, mm. so that's actually where the German like Santa Claus is German, right? And like Santa. Yeah. Santa Saint Nicholas came on the se- in the morning of December sixth. You would either either get like a small bag of presents. There's always an orange or mandarin in there, um, some candy, um, and you would open that uh, on the sixth. And then the twenty fourth is like Christmas Eve, and you get presents on that again. So Germans celebrate it almost twice. Or oh, Bavarian cities. I don't know how it is in other parts of Germany. That's mm-hmm. how it is for us. I know that in the Netherlands it's the same way, mm-hmm. um, only slightly more racist because they have those. <laughs> <laughs> they they yeah. still do black facing there, remember? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen yeah. that before. Yeah, it's not great. I, I lived in the Netherlands, so they do also the the sixth, um, and that's like uh, Santa Claus, right? Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, so the Coca Cola Santa Claus comes on the sixth, but we also on the same day. If you were bad, Krampus comes, right? Mm. And he gives you the so you either get like a chunk of coal or like presents. Uh, and Krampus is like is the bad guy, so I guess like the question can be answered with with a good guy and a bad guy. So maybe Matthias Summer can be the Krampus. <laughs> he always looks miserable. <laughs> yeah. So I have uh, th- I had a good think about this, and um, I'm trying to think which head coach in the Bundesliga is the most Santa Clausy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll, I'll, so basically, what that means is the cuddliest, slightly porky. <laughs> no, maybe that's the wrong word. Cuddliest. Let's go with cuddly. Um, I've got three options for you, and I'll let you pick. All right. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Nef- number one is Stefan Baumgart. Okay. Number two is Urs Fischer. Mm-hmm. And number three is Felix Magat. Um, Felix McGat would be a great Krampus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can you imagine Felix McGat was Santa. How terrifying would that be? Yeah, exactly. That's why he's Krampus. You can get your presents after a hundred push-ups. <laughs> That's. I'm, I, I yeah. think 
I think Urs Fisher would make a good Santa. He seems like a nice guy. Yeah, so so here's a, another story that I have for you. Back in the Bavarian villages, when Krampus would pick up the really bad kids, put them in a big bag, <laughs> and actually throw them into a haystack. Um, you know, this is totally illegal now. You would have child <laughs> child services at your doorstep. But back in the day, so Felix Magat is my Krampus. I would mm. actually say um, Urs Fischer. Yeah, I think so too. Can, I, can we just take a minute to appreciate how absolutely mental uh German kind of yeah whole like um what's the word traditions are like that chimes so much with the Brothers Grimm stuff which almost mm-hmm. always kind of rotates around the idea of something eating a child at some point, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'd be interested if anyone's kind of done a deep dive into like the historical context of a, a country built on these kind of you know childhood stories where they're all so horrible and grim. And the grim stories were literally collected. I mean, they're from Austria, right? But they were collected to sort of spur German nationalism, right? They collected these stories. They went around the countryside to collect these stories. Mm. Um, and, is the brother and the, the brothers of, Grimm Austrian? Yeah, from Vienna. Oh, for goodness sake! Well, there's me showing up my ignorance there. I thought they were German. Well, I thank thought they were from the, the Black of... Forest. No. Well, so you're right because they are actually also they have fam like family rootings in Kassel, but I'm pretty sure they collected all their stories in Vienna. Oh, they collected um, them there, right? I'm just yeah. on Wikipedia. The brothers Grimm were a brother duo of German academics. Yeah. Um, and yeah. they did this project to unify the country in the face of Napoleon. Right, I see. Yeah, and yeah. so all these collections of these really grim stories. I mean, they even came up with a word. Mm. Um, so uh, my wife is holding up the Wikipedia page for me here. And it <laughs> says Castle, Castle Göttingen. Um. Yeah, I don't know why I have Vienna in here. Maybe they was maybe I'm mixing this up with someone else. But um, my German literature classes in, in university date back a few years now, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> the Napoleon thing is definitely true, and there was a collection of um, like of stories. But you're quite right; a lot of them are quite dark and yeah, they're terrifying. Um, but you know, like having grown up. Um, I, I grew up in Munich, but a lot of my family lives on the border to Austria in in Berchtesgaden, right? Mm. And nights are very very long there because it's right in the right in the mountains, and um, it can be really dark and long nights there, and it can also be spooky. Mm. So it, it makes sense, and you know, like a lot of these stories kind of stem from from this kind of experience, these small mountain village experiences, right? And so it kind of makes sense that people come up with these a little bit darker stories and yeah as yeah. i said it not, stop, not stop kids running into the into the forest yeah don't be silly like you, you scared scared them and i mean i grew still grew up with a lot of these stories because i did grow up in small mountain villages i guess so yeah. <laughs> i'm just laughing to myself because people are listening to this podcast right now thinking what the hell are these guys talking about they're probably driving their car to work or something thinking i'm catch i'm here to catch up on you know, Vatska <laughs> renovating the DFB and these guys have gone on a 10-minute rabbit hole talking about the Brothers Grimm and yeah. your childhood growing up in the Austrian border. <laughs> well, well this, is, this is also like a culture, right? You get like a little bit of a cultural lesson. So well, exactly, you go. yeah. But, okay, so before we move on to the next question, what would you serve for food? So this is an interesting thing. I'm actually going to throw... I, I assumed you had a number of German suggestions here, so I actually have a, a, a Polish suggestion which has mm-hmm. kind of got a German um, tinge to it. So every year uh, I have a Christmas night out with my, my good friends who I've been friends with since I was a kid. And um, it's actually this Friday. I've, I've taken a day off and everything for it. Um, and what we do is we go to this little restaurant in the West End of Glasgow, uh, which is called the, S- the Sikorsky Club which is like a Polish club and um, mm-hmm. it's it's right it's it's like a converted townhouse that looks out over Kelvin Groves Park 
um, and they have this little restaurant in the basement that you walk into and it looks like some sort of Bavarian ski lodge. Uh, I'll need to take you, Manu, when you come to Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And we go there every Christmas for Christmas night out and we all get, well, not all of us because some of us are now vegan and vegetarian, but most of us now get veal schnitzel. And Mm. although that's possibly not the most Christmassy thing you can get, that's what I now associate with Christmas to a large extent, because I always get that on my Christmas night out. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what I would suggest. And if you're ever in Glasgow, I would certainly recommend looking up the place. It's called the restaurant itself is called Ujarka. Um And uh, yeah, so the, <laughs> I would suggest schnitzel for Christmas, as bizarre as that may sound. Yeah, I usually like to eat something wild, like deer, like venison. It's like something that we usually do. Something uh, wild? Like, what do you, do you go catch it yourself? No, oh God, no, I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are long gone. I'm not don't just go walk into a forest and shoot a venison. <laughs> <laughs> but that is definitely like a lot of us eat that. Um, yeah, and schnitzel is not a bad choice. Hmm. Do you know it's interesting? Schn- um, I, I, venison's a really interesting one for me because here in Scotland we have like overgrown. Uh, deer population mm. because they were reintroduced and there's basically the the farmers and um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this to the international audience but basically a lot of the land in, a lot of the highlands in Glasgow or Scotland rather is owned by people who work the land and basically there's a huge uproar whenever anyone suggests bringing reintroducing things like wolves to the countryside yeah. which would keep the deer population in check and i my solution to this is just eat all the deer because i think yeah i think deer's so much tastier than beef it's delicious yeah i don't understand why it's not a thing you know um so i'm with you on that i must admit so that's what you're gonna have on christmas day yeah, so like that's what I would I would love to have, and we don't always have it. It's hard to get sometimes. You have to like mm. pre-order it and all that. Um, I mean, like in Canada, we often do just a chicken or maybe sometimes a turkey. Uh, my family traditionally did a fondue quite often, mm. like not a cheese fondue, like a, a beef fondue um, with broth. Mm. Um, so that was something that we would traditionally have as well. But yeah, venison is probably my favorite. Interesting. Yeah, we we go. I mean, I don't know if how traditional, how much how similar this is to what people do in Canada and the US, but in the UK, it's turkey and salted pork for the mm. most part. Um, and I adore it, I must admit. My wife is doing yeah. Christmas there this year, and she's going to do everything she can to sneak in as many Brussels sprouts as she can, <laughs> uh, which is going to drive me insane because I hate them. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the most part. I'm trying to think if there's anything kind of fun that we could stick in there, but yeah. I mean, how oh, would, what would you bro- say? We're stuck, we're stuck in the Brothers Grimm. That's pretty fun. That's true. What What would you say is a traditional Bavarian Christmas dinner? Ah, oh, man, that's a really good question. I mean, a guns, so like um, geese is what a lot of people do. Mm. Um, but I, it's kind of interesting. I don't think there is a real tradition in that sense. Mm. Um it's not like the same in the US where everyone does turkey. Yeah. It's far more varied and depending on the family and where the family's from. Yeah. These things tend to be um these things these things tend to depend on what's available because I think I think yeah. ge- I think goose was actually very popular in the UK until you know it stopped being convenient to buy so people just started buying turkeys instead. Yeah. So Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's sense. just yeah exactly so that that's just that um but yeah so sorry if we don't have anything interesting but that's my it, <laughs> schnitzel's a pretty german thing as well you know so you know yeah. people that's what people probably expect us to say yeah absolutely all right we got a football question here uh jp and we can ask answer this really qu- quickly if messi wins the world cup is he undoubtedly the goat if not would your all your all opinion is still the greatest to ever do it I mean, Messi has to win it first. Then we can talk, have this conversation. What do you think? Um, 
I think he probably already is the goat, to be honest with you. But mm. I, I, I think winning the World Cup would be a great way for him to kind of wrap up his career. I know, he's, I know he's not retired or anything, but I think that's the one thing he's holding out for. So yeah, that's. I think I'd probably go with JP in that and say he probably would. I think he would. If he, I think if he wins it, he's probably the goat. Mm. Yeah, because then like that, the Maradona, the weight of Maradona is off his shoulders, right? Um, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, and I think to be honest, like even reaching the final last time was incredible, and mm. he's doing—he's basically doing it again this time. I—I I think I think you know we get too hung up on whether these players win things without even really appreciating how much they do in those competitions. I'm thinking of like Zidane reaching the final with France at mm. oh, what turn was that? Was that in South Af- South uh, South Africa, possibly? No, 2006 Germany. Yeah, when he hit the headbutt. Mm-hmm. Germany. Yeah. Against Italy. I mean, I don't think not winning the tournament takes away from how incredible he was in that tournament. I mean, in fairness, he won it in 1998. Yeah, so he's already done that to an extent. But I think if yeah. Messi reaches the final, and we're recording this just before the Croatia game, so I'm afraid we're going to date this very quickly. But uh, if he reaches the final, I still think that's an incredible achievement for take, for for, for de- basically dragging Argentina to two cup finals or to yeah. two World Cup finals. I think is comparable to winning it once or something, mm-hmm. you know. And he has been dragging them, so 100%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next question comes from NK. He asked something about Neuer, so we're going to skip that. But any concerns on reports of the new set positions at Bayern with Müller? As a number nine, and Sane exclusively as RM's right midfield, competing with Knabri. Long-term Sane concerns around this development. Hmm. I yeah, didn't I, see I must his admit, reports as Müller as a number nine. I've not. I I must admit, I've not really seen his reports myself. Um, I'd be surprised if there's a new tactical system in place that really includes Müller uh, as a standout number nine to me. Uh, you know, Sani exclusively on the right, competing with Gnabry because I think Sani actually plays much better as a number ten. Mm-hmm. Possibly even a number eight for Bayern. Um, I think he likes to kind of play off the striker. Um, yeah. And he's asked about long-term concerns about Sani's development. I actually think Sani's pretty fine. He, he, I think he's actually pretty sound at Bayern right now. To be honest with you, I know he didn't have a great World Cup because he was injured, but I actually think Germany looked much more potent in attack when he did come on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's kind of got his head down. He's kind of got his head straight. I saw some reports linked him to Arsenal. Which were bizarre because I think he's actually for a long for the first time in a long time since maybe Schalke, and even before that, I even even not sure if you can consider that since as soon as he as soon as he hit the first team at Schalke, he was linked with moves away. So potentially the first time in his career, he's at a club that can match his ambition that he feels a little grounded in. Nagelsmann mm. obviously a big fan, um. So I think I think he's I think he's pretty well set at Bayern. I'd be more concerned about Gnabry, um. To be honest yeah. with you, who um, seems to be a little all over the place in terms of where he wants to play. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any great concerns about Sani, to be honest. It, it, quite the contrary. I think this is probably his best spell at the moment. Mm, yeah, right. I'd probably agree with that. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'm curious what Bayern are going to do with this number nine position. Like, I still don't think clubs scout at the World Cup, but if they do. I'm not sure they came away from this World Cup thinking, oh, Harry Kane would be a great number nine for us. Mm. Yeah. Not not for that price, anyways. No. Well, I must say, I got to say, like, watching him kind of roll up a in that game, I thought Harry Kane actually played very well in the France game. It, it, it kind of all got brushed aside because he missed that penalty, mm. but I actually think he really showed how talented he is. And I actually think he played better than Mbappe in the match. So yeah. I would be surprised if Oliver Kahn, who might have even been in the stands or now was when watching at home, was watching. There was there was one moment in particular where he rolled up Meccano, uh, which led to the penalty call, which was maybe a bit soft. But I think the impressive part was the manner in which he did roll him in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that showed what he's capable of as a striker. Um, I've, of course, alongside what he's been doing at Tottenham for years. and but Yeah. Which is what uh, matters. Yeah, exactly. And so, no, I actually, I, I actually thought watching that game, this is the kind of guy that the Bayern could use 
you know, mm. um, because he's not just another number nine like Lewandowski. He's a very good player at link up playing uh, as well, you know. So that that yeah. would be interesting to see if he ends up being a long term target. But I'm sure, Upa Makana would rather have him on his team rather than play against him. That's for sure. The only thought I had about this World Cup performance, I'm curious to see what the response in England is going to be like with him missing that penalty, and if that could maybe drive him abroad. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, it, it, it just kind of depends, I guess, on what he wants to do with the rest of his career. You know, yeah. he's obviously he's still got a good couple of years left at the top table, but he probably still wonders whether, or he's now probably beginning to wonder whether um, he, he can do that at Tottenham or not. Mm-hmm. But that yeah. that's, I guess that's a discussion that we can pick up in January when the rumours undoubtedly start going again. A hundred percent. But yeah, the Müller number nine, Maybe to finally answer the question, I didn't see that anywhere, and I don't think this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, this is a question that's going to unfortunately get dated really quickly, so I'm going to answer it as quickly as possible. Out of the remaining teams at the World Cup, would you favor to win? I would love to see a first-time team crown champion. What's your take? Do you see any big... Oh, do you see any big transfers coming in, the, in this winter? Um, the first one, I want a first-time World Cup winner. So I'm all in on a Croatia or Morocco final, but this might be dated by the time this comes out. Uh, but I'm all in for a first time winner. How about you? Yeah, I'm, I can certainly agree with that. I kind of tweeted that out a few days ago that I'd like to see that happen. Um, I've I've since kind of warmed to the idea of Messi winning it with Argentina. I think that'd be a nice yeah. moment. Um, so I'm kind of. I found myself basically saying anyone but France, <laughs> you know, which, which is really no fault of France's at all. Um, uh, it's just that, yeah, I and my 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 preferences would be up there between first team, first time winner, uh, or or Messi. I think Morocco mm. somehow winning it would be really quite special. We've seen Croatia obviously got to the final um, yeah. before; they've kind of already reach that peak you know it's crazy to think that they might still get there because i remember speaking to Cramerich before the tournament and people were asking about that and he was just kind of you could see he was just he would just look off into the distance and get all glassy eyed and say you know it was incredible and he was like he didn't say there's no chance that they could do it but it felt to him like a career high that he was going to cherish for the rest of his year and to think that he might be able to do it again uh, is incredible. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I I think, unfortunately, no offense to any any French people listening, but them winning it again would be my least favorite outcome. I have a huge soft spot for Croatia. I mean, I I went to started going to school. I was I was schooled the year the the Balkan conflict started, so I had a lot of refugee kids in in my class. Um, mm. So and through that, uh, I my. my my grandfather owned a huge gardening company on the border to Austria. And a lot of the people that worked there were Croatians. And so I always had Croatians around me in my entire life. And, <laughs> have a, and I've been to the country many times. So I have a huge soft spot for them. Um, I know they're tough as nails. Uh, they're, not every, they're not everyone's cup of tea. I understand that. But they're my cup of tea. And so I, I would love to see them win the World Cup. Yeah, do you know it's interesting here in Scotland we have the inevitable discussion about you know, oh you know Croatia are a country the same side as Scotland, why can't we yep. do what they've done? And I've always been tempted to jump in and say, well, maybe if we have a civil war and raise an entire generation of kids through a war, maybe we might have the battle hardened professionals who are who walk onto a football pitch and say this is nothing compared to what I've gone through as a child then maybe we might have players who are capable of winning the World Cup but come on yeah Croatia also has a huge diaspora right yeah similar to um, Jewish people and Armenians so you know they they, they have the ability to draw from talent from other countries like Mm -hmm. Switzerland Austria Germany the United States Um, so you know that helps you quite a bit as well I did ask uh, Kramerich this ahead of the World Cup, you know, why are Croatia so good at producing footballers? And his answer to me was, quite literally, because we have a beautiful woman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was his only answer to me. So, uh, yeah, take from that what you want. Okay, well, there you go. There's the quote of the day already. Uh, do you see any big transfers coming this winter break? In Germany, uh, no, because German clubs don't do big transfers. Not in the winter, no. 
No, I don't uh, think I so. No. I mean, the goalkeeper situation. We'll, we'll discuss this tomorrow. Yeah, uh, we'll later talk. This week. We'll, we'll save that one for the transfer show. Okay, so we got one more big one and one small one. Um, with Manu having spoke of MLS clubs and how they develop talent in their facilities, if when do you think they will ever be trusted enough for top Euro teams to loan kids out stateside? Or is geography too big of a problem? For example, a Gabriel Vidovic, when would he possibly end up at Philadelphia instead of Vitesse? So Gabriel Vidovic is a Bayern Munich talent who is currently mm. on loan at Vitesse. Um, so my answer to that is that I've heard rumblings that Bayern Munich are thinking of putting a team in MLS. Oh, wow. Yeah. A fully-fledged club. This is thinking, so this is super early stages. This may never ever materialize, right? But they they have thought about it, yeah. That'd be quite something. Yeah. Um, if they ever are going to do it or go a different route, I, I don't know. But I know that that's something that they have thought about. Mm. Um, because they have a partnership with Dallas, which they're not 100% happy with. So they may move that partnership to a different club. Mm. Um but they definitely think that the league is at a state or place now where they can develop their own talent. So. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I think, I mean, you'll know far more about this than I will, but the impression I get is that German clubs still treat America as a place where they can kind of scoop up students mm-hmm. who obviously have a very good athletic um, upbringing or athletic education through either yeah. high school or university then they bring them to the to Germany and then they kind of off they kind of give them the that kind of finishing school of you know a European football um that seems to me like the kind of aspect I guess the the question here is whether they would kind of loan their kids to the US which I'm not inclined to suggest they would just because I mean you know Bayern Munich have a very good youth academy um yeah. they're very specific quite specific about where they send their kids if at all, really, um, and and like the like the, the you know the, the subscriber said there, um, who was it? David said, um, it the geography is a big issue. I mean, and, and and if I was an MLS fan, I'd probably wouldn't really want that to be the case. I'd probably rather my clubs produce their own players, sold them at good prices when they're ready to go, uh, mm. rather the, rather than relying on what you do see in places like Belgium, I guess, where a lot of the clubs end up being like feeder clubs don't they mm-hmm. yeah i mean like we have the example of new york red bulls which is essentially a feeder club to leipzig mm. right um and aston villa is the ownership of aston villa is bidding for a team in las vegas um so you every once in a while you have these rumors come up whether it's going to be an MLS or maybe the league below it, you the USL championship, right? Where teams are cheaper, a lot cheaper, mm. because an expansion fee is about um, 350 million US dollars. And that's not mm. even, that doesn't even include a stadium or anything, right? I mean, I was just in St. Louis where they paid $350 million. And on top of that, another $650 million to build everything. So it's a billion dollars. <laughs> it's it's a quite a lot of money. You need, you, need, you need someone to help you with that, I think, if you're doing that mm. as a club. Yeah, of course. Um, um, but I do still think that it's interesting that this has been considered. I'm not sure if this is something that they have thought about. Um, you know, the source that told me that they that this is essentially they, that this was mentioned in passing and they were saying like this could be a way that we maybe approach this. Um, you know, so really super early stages. Um, but they're not the only team thinking about it. So I don't know if that answers the question. Mm. Um, in detail, but this is as close as an answer I can give in this regard. Um, the final question then, Stefan, is Wu Tong Wong ask <laughs> Riesling or beer? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to go with beer for this one because I think Riesling is probably the last thing that I'm ordering on a menu. I, I like a good German Riesling. Um, I actually really like a good German Riesling, especially when it has that um, kind of gasoline smell to it, the mineral smell to it. Um, <laughs> gasoline smell. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a thing. It's a thing. Um, it's the minerality from the wine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. little bit of like the perfume from like, almost like it, it smells almost like oil gasolini. Yeah, it's actually must, quite good. Yeah, no, I must admit, I I have I do like a good red wine, and actually, I really like a good Austrian like uh, Zweigelt, like you know the oh, kind yeah. of 
a nice a nice red. Um, there's a really there's a there's a wine shop right next to where I lived in Glasgow uh, that sold a really nice red wine. It was called Funk, which I think short for Funk Still or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I adored that. So I would trade in your Riesling uh, for his for his Weigel. So just a just a quick hop over the border to Austria. Austria uh, makes great wine. Vienna yeah. is absolutely incredible for it. I was speaking to someone in a wine shop recently, actually, because I was asking about if they had anything quite like a Zweigelt, and they recommended a nice organic red, and they basically said they're quite hard to get in the UK because the Austrians tend to keep all the good stuff for themselves, which yep. <laughs> just sums up Austria really well, I think, compared to like <laughs> other places like France, where they ship out the Bordeaux wine as quick as they can, and austria and wherever else they produce wine but in in sorry australia rather uh or california or whatever but in austria mm. they're like nope we're keeping the good stuff for ourselves germany does the same with the riesling a lot of the best stuff is actually not exported mm. which you know um it's a shame because like the the best stuff obviously you can only get there in like really small specialty shops um but i guess like for me i i do love a good riesling but i also really like beer and it really depends on the occasion Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, this is the most benign conversation, I guess, talking a football podcast, but yeah. I much prefer wine through the week and then maybe a few beers in the, at the weekend if I'm out and about. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm in Germany, I'm obviously drinking beer, you know, especially if I'm down in Munich. Definitely drink beer with football to keep it to yes. football. Definitely yes. when I watch a game. Uh, I will not open a glass of Riesling. That just doesn't seem, yeah, that doesn't seem right. Mm. So it would definitely be a beer. And for me, also a Friday night to like celebrate the start of the weekend, I do like a cold beer. Mm. Yeah, I get that. It depends what beer I suppose, but yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the answer is both. <laughs> the answer yes. is actually neither Austrian red wine. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. So this is the final show, uh, <laughs> the, the final midweek show uh, of the year. We're going to have one more transfer roundup later this week. Um, and that that's that. Uh, mm. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Stefan, any final thoughts on this? Uh, no. If you are not a paid subscriber and you somehow manage to enjoy that, then do please consider over the holiday season taking a subscription and we will have more of these silly episodes through the week. Uh, I'm sure any subscribers will be able to tell you how much fun they seem to enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, the, the gist of it is it's a nice, it's, a, it's, it's an episode that we like to kind of, you know, offer something back to subscribers, whether it's, you know, a Q&A, mailbag, mm. stuff like that. Yeah, we had like a great show on uh, very rated Bundesliga, Bundesliga World Cup players, for example. Um, earlier this year, we did a show on where we built a starting, you know, a, a squad that could challenge Bayern Munich, not using Bayern Munich players. Mm. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that you find. Um, it's all, yeah, and it's also a good, uh, it's, what we found is it's a good vehicle to talk about breaking news that happens through the week. Yeah. So we can keep, especially during the regular season, we can keep the Monday show for the Bundesliga match results and then this show for talking about deeper topics. So Exactly. Yeah, so if that's in something interesting, do consider subscribing. And uh, yeah, and then I guess we'll see you guys in 2023 after, yeah. I guess we, could, we can do the big sign-off in the transfer show, but for subscribers anyway, uh, yeah. That's sad. All right, guys, until next time. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.